I'm very pleased to, to have this uh, possibility to present you Professor Laurent Barachar uh, from the Research Institute INRIA from France. And he will speak about the pseudo-holomorphic functions and Dirichlet problems on planar rectifiable domains. So please, Laurent, thank you for thank you very much. Presentation. Thank you very much for the presentation. So it's a it's a pleasure and honor to be a, a speaker at your seminar. And um, um, we are going to speak um, uh, of uh, pseudo-holomorphic functions and the connection with uh, Dirichlet problems uh, for elliptic equation on uh, planar domains. So maybe we start uh, we start by taking a closer look at what pseudo-holomorphic functions are. They are solutions to a D-bar equation, uh, the right-hand side of which is a, a real linear uh, expression in the known function, right? So it looks like this, that uh, D-bar phi is uh, a times phi bar plus B times phi. Phi is a known function. A, B are functions. And uh, the equation should be satisfied in the distributional sense on some open subset of the plane. Here, uh, as usual, D, D bar are the complex uh, differentiation operators. Um, and the equation, of course, uh, to make sense distributionally, uh, should like have a right hand side, which is at least say an integrable, local integrable function. So for instance, this will be satisfied if the functions A and B uh, lie in some Lebesgue space of index R uh, locally in omega and the solution phi is seeked in uh, Lebesgue space, local Lebesgue space of index gamma, where gamma is bigger than R, well, than the conjugate of R, right? So that's plain. And uh, so something is wrong in here. Right. So necessarily then, a solution phi, in fact, of course, is better behaved than just being um, in this local Lebesgue space L gamma, because it is automatically upgraded to a, a Sobolev class of index lambda given by this expression here, right? Essentially, because a d bar of phi has this regularity, then, okay, um, you have for the uh, D phi a similar uh, regularity. So um, that's for the equation. And now uh, we normalize our definition of uh, pseudo holomorphic function. So I have a problem with my something is wrong with my screen what is that so oh i'm sorry for that something went wrong but what is that oh, i'm sorry for this okay so um we normalize the definition by uh, writing the equation in this simplified form where the function b is zero and the unknown is now a function w so the name has changed from phi to w because we normalize the equation that's d bar w is alpha w bar and this normalization is in fact no loss of generality at least when r is at least two because if we set W uh, in the previous equation to be uh, phi times e to the minus b, where b is a function, satisfies this d-bar equation, 
and b was a second coefficient in the previous equation, right? Was a function that was a coefficient of phi. Uh, then it turned out that this w satisfied the normalized version of the equation here, okay? So you can go from phi to w by this simple transformation and uh, the coefficient alpha is a previous a multiplied by some um, some uh, exponential of modulus one, which is here. So the uh, integrability did not change. And uh, why do we assume that R is at least two? Because we need to warrant the chain in the Lamnitz rule in the previous computation. And so we use the fact that the exponential of a sub f function um, where the function and its first derivative uh, belong to L2, that is in fact included in the Sobolev space W1L for L strictly less than two. And we use this uh, when we do the previous transformation to demonstrate that D bar W is indeed alpha W bar. So we need to justify that we use the uh, chain rule and the Leibniz rule. That's the reason for the uh, assumption. All right, so pseudo-holomorphic functions may be simplest generalization of holomorphic functions. And uh, just a little bit of uh, history very quick. So uh, I think they, they catch early attention in uh, 1931 already, and then they were by Theodore Rascu, and they were taken up by Carleman in 1933. Uh, they were extensively studied when R is strictly bigger than two uh, by at least two uh, schools, the school of Bears uh, and the school of Vicua uh, a bit uh, later on. So Bears was more leaning on the function, I mean, analytic and function theoretic aspects using power series and kind of generalization of them. Uh, whereas uh, Vekua was uh, maybe more in the uh, uh, spirit of uh, singular integrals and application to geometry, um, elasticity, hydrodynamics, and uh, there have been many more recent developments uh, in connection with boundary value problems. And I just mentioned the one you can see here where it it is uh, kind of uh, uh, transpiring that this is much of a Russian subject, in fact, right? Um, we are going to talk especially on the Hardy classes. These were, uh, I think, introduced by Musev and uh, developed by Klementov. So later on, they were taken by a number of uh, authors. I indicate a couple of them here. Um, and, uh, okay, I'd like to kill this thing, okay. Um, these equations, these pseudo-holomorphic functions, they, they are a convenient framework for 2D uh, uh, free boundary inverse problem. And I should mention problems of Bernoulli type that were taken up by the authors shown here. Um, okay, so that was just a little bit of history. Maybe now I'd like to develop like in detail the connection to the connectivity equation because this will be a major uh, thrust of the talk. Mm -hmm. So if we have um, a pseudo-holomorphic um, function satisfying this normalized equation, or d bar w is equal to alpha w bar, and alpha is the uh, d bar of some real valued function. Okay, so these are, of course, a little bit of a special class of equation because the alpha is particular. Um, then, if we set sigma uh, to be the square of uh, e to the beta, 
Uh, and if you set nu uh, to be one minus sigma divided by one plus sigma, and finally we define f to be w plus nu w bar divided by square root one minus nu the square, um, where of course w is a solution to this equation here, then you can check that f satisfies the uh, conjugate Beltrami equation here, sometimes called the Beltrami equation of the second kind. So d bar f is nu times uh, df bar. Uh, so that one is not like a standard Beltrami equation because that one is not complex linear, right? Only real linear. So it's uh, Beltrami of the uh, second kind or conjugate Beltrami equation. And uh, this equation is in fact equivalent by inspection to the generalized cauchy riemann system, which is written here. So it's, it's like the standard cauchy riemann equations, except that you get this factor of sigma here in each equation. And um, this system of cauchy riemann equation has a compatibility condition, which is precisely this conductivity equation. So the divergence of sigma times gradient of u is equal to zero. So this is the connection between elliptic equation in the plane and uh, pseudo-holomorphic function. So if you prove something on the elliptic equation, you, at least on some certain elliptic equation, you prove things on uh, pseudo-holomorphic function and vice versa. In this talk, it will be, um, vice versa. We shall show things about pseudo-holomorphic functions and deduce things about uh, the conductivity equation. All right. Uh, so we now uh, maybe take up Easy something very know. classical for such a, yeah, such equation. So the so-called bare similarity principle, similarity to uh, holomorphic function, I guess. So if you have a bounded domain or coefficient in LR, these notations will be fixed during the talk. Uh, so R is always the summability index of the coefficient. And uh, you have a pseudo-holomorphic function associated to uh, alpha. Then you can always factorize it like the exponential of a function S times another function capital F, where F is holomorphic and S lies in a subordinate space of um, exponent R. And uh, in fact, uh, the sub left norm of S is controlled by the Lebesgue norm of alpha in LR and constant C depends only on R and omega. So, okay, maybe the proof is um, very well known and we don't need to give it, but maybe it's good to have at least one proof. This is very easy. So we simply uh, set uh, w bar divided by w to be zero by convention when w is zero. And uh, otherwise we define this function s. So at points where w is zero, the integrand is zero. And uh, okay, you easily see that um, this depends only on properties of the uh, Cauchy transform, the fact that, that Cauchy kernel is fundamental solution for the d-bar equation, you get that d-bar s is alpha w bar over w, and you get this estimate from, uh, essentially from a standard calderon zygmunt uh, theory for the uh, Berling transform, right? And um, to show that e to the minus s times w is holomorphic, and this will be our function f, you simply compute uh, the d bar and 
by the very equation you have here, you get zero. So again, Leibniz and chain rules are justified um, because R is at least two. And um, this principle is useful because essentially uh, in the factorization, F is holomorphic and we know a lot about it. And uh, S is, um, has some smoothness and satisfies bounds independent of W. Um, already you can see some differences between the cases where R is strictly greater than two and the case where R is equal to two, because when R is strictly greater than two, then um, the S in fact is bounded, its exponential is bounded singularity zeros or those of the function f and for instance you see immediately that the zeros they are isolated and that the function is locally whole or continuous uh, in omega and um, this is a sort of a poor man's version of the of course a much deeper result which is the uh, uh, holder continuity of uh, uh, the uh, D. Georgian and Nash theorem, which comes from strict ellipticity. But in contrast, when R is equal to two, then S only belongs to W12 and its exponential could be zero or infinity on a set, a small set, because it will be of uh, Bessel B12 capacity zero, but this set no longer consists of isolated points. and. The solution W to the equation needs not be uh, locally holder continuous anymore. It's not even bounded, okay? And this reflects that we, we no longer have strict ellipticity when R is equal to two. Uh, okay, a little bit uh, surprising maybe is a converse to the birth principle, which says, okay, if we have an open set omega and uh, function alpha, which is uh, in the Lebesgue class all uh, L um, R, uh, and if F is a holomorphic function on omega, then you can find a function S in the sub F class W one R such that the product of your initial homomorphic function with e to the s is a solution to the equation. Okay, so you have um, um, you have a converse showing that essentially any holomorphic function f can appear in the factorization of solutions uh, to uh, um, uh, an equation of pseudo holomorphy and. Uh, when omega is then smooth, you can impose uh, conditions on S in terms of its trace on the boundary. So you could impose its imaginary part on the boundary in this um, fractional space here, which characterizes the regularity of traces of some of functions. And you can also adjust to your will the mean of its real part. And then S is unique and you get uh, this, uh, this uh, estimate uh, about its norm in terms of the data, alpha, psi, and lambda. So alpha is a coefficient of the equation. Psi is a trace of the imaginary part that you require and lambda is a mean of the real part, right? And you could, of exchange the role of real imaginary part if you want. Um, and, and this, in some sense, characterizes S. So you, when you make this choice, S becomes unique. Um, all right, so uh, if you think about it bluntly, the result says that any holomorphic F can happen in this factorization. There are infinitely many such S for fixed F. When omega is then smooth, the result parameterizes S by its boundary trace, and this raises the general issue of describing boundary values of pseudo-holomorphic functions. 
which leads us to lean over Hardy's mirror spaces. So um, let us define Hardy's mirror spaces. The novelty here is that we allow alpha to be in L2, right? When alpha is in L uh, R, where R is strictly bigger than two, this has been, um, I think, uh, this has been taken up much by um, uh, Musaev and, and Klimentov, but with a maybe uh, Hardy rather than Smirnov definition of Hardy spaces. So, but these are equivalent. Now here we deal with a, a Smirnov definition um, um, as follows. So, um, we say that the hardest mirror space is a space of W for which this um, integrals over uh, circles. So we live in the disk for the moment being, you need disk. The integral over the concentric circles inside, they are bounded. And um, that is a standard definition. Uh, and for simplicity, we put W sub rho to mean W restricted to the circle of uh, radius rho. And we have the following theorem that each W in this hardest mirror space has a trace on T, uh, which is in fact the LP limit of the restriction of uh, the function to um, circles, so the LP limit as the radius goes to one. And uh, this hardest mirror space is uh, a real Banach space. Uh, and you have that the norm, which is defined in seven, is in fact equivalent to the LP norm of the trace. Um, Okay, so maybe a couple of remarks uh, are in order. So um, when R is strictly bigger than two, the birth principle uh, tells you that you have this factorization where S is continuous. And so F belongs to the holomorphic, the usual holomorphic Hardy space. And therefore the boundary values, they are also non-tangential limits almost everywhere. But when R is equal to two, then there are some coefficients alpha for which the members of this hardest mirror space are non-tangentially unbounded everywhere on the unit circle, right? So we no longer have in general non-tangential limits. Instead, we have this LP convergence that we've been describing uh, uh, on the previous slide. And uh, accordingly, the members of this hardest mirror of space, they may be locally unbounded in, in um, actually this omega should be D. I'm sorry for this mistake. And uh, this hardest mirror of pseudo-holomorphic function, they may also have a non-discrete uh, non set of zeros, right? And uh, both the zero set and the infinity set, of course, they are small. They must have B12 capacity zero, but they need not, uh, they need not consist of isolated points nor be empty uh, respectively. And uh, a final remark here is, and like in the case of homomorphic functions, uh, the restriction of uh, W to uh, concentric circles uh, defines a uh, family of uh, LP bounded functions all right, but it is not true that the norm is a convex function of uh, the logarithm of the radius. Uh, it is not even the case in general that it increases with the radius, right? So this is a difference with the standard a holomorphic case, right? When we have the wreath theorem. Um, all right, now let's introduce a 
class of domain on which we really want to um, work. Uh, so they are simply connected and uh, they satisfy this one of these equivalent conditions. Now the boundary is rectifiable and that's equivalent to say that the derivative lies in the Hari space H1 of the disk. Uh, so we call those rectifiable domains. And uh, the conformal map phi from the disk onto rectifiable domain extends to a homomorphism of the closures. And uh, because the domain is bounded, of course, the derivative of the conformal map uh, lies in L2 of the unit disk. Uh, I'm saying the conformal map, I mean any conformal map, okay? And uh, this is a class of domains we are going to take up. So we shall adapt the definition of pseudo holomorphic Hardy smear spaces on rectifiable domains as follows. So uh, for omega such domain and alpha coefficient in L2 of the domain, uh, a solution to the pseudo-homomorphic equation d bar w equals alpha w bar um, lies in the hardy smirnov space um, of index p if uh, one of the following equivalent conditions is satisfied. There exists a sequence of rectifiable Joran curves eventually surrounding any compact subset of omega uh, such that the integral over these curves um, is uniformly bounded, but the bound may depend on the family of curve. And uh, that's equivalent to say that uh, if you pick a conformal map and you uh, take a family of curves which consists of the level lines, right, of the modulus. So these are really the level curves of the green function with ball at uh, the image of zero. Then um, the integrals, the LP integral over these curves are bounded. Okay, so the equivalence between these two um, Properties, of course, you recognize as a classical uh, property for holomorphic functions. And uh, what this theorem is telling us is that it also works for pseudo holomorphic functions with coefficient in L2. And of course, one consequence of the theorem that the Hardy um, Smirnov space is a vector space because you have a family of curves that works for all functions um, in a single stroke. So this makes for a definition of the Hardy's mirror space and um, any conformal map can be used and different conformal maps give rise to different level curves, of course. Uh, but the uh, corresponding norms are equivalent. Okay? So this makes the Horius mirror space uh, into a Banach space. Uh, okay, so if um, we have a rectifiable domain and phi a conformal map and alpha a coefficient in LR where R is larger than or equal to two, uh, this little lemma is um, is uh, saying that a function lies in the Horace mirror space of index p on omega, even only if the function here uh, obtained by composing with a conformal map and multiplying with the uh, one over p power of derivative lies in the hardest mirror class on the disk with a modified coefficient alpha, which is obtained essentially by composing alpha with a conformal map, multiplying by this factor, which is of modulus one, and is um, e to the twice the argument to the uh, 
derivative times i to the one over p, that's a unimodular factor, and uh, you multiply this by the conjugate of derivative, okay? And this new coefficient beta has an L2 norm, which is uh, controlled by the LR norm of alpha, and this way you can um, create a bijection between the Hardy-Smirnov of class of index P on omega and a certain Hardy-Smirnov of class on the unit disk. And of course, this is uh, valuable to study Hardy-Smirnov of functions uh, on more general rectifiable domains than the disk. Um, the lemma shows why the case R equals two uh, on the disk is important because in fact, it is key to study Hardy-Smirnov of classes and rectifiable domain. The point being that even if alpha lies in a Lebesgue class uh, of exponent strictly bigger than two, uh, beta, which is involved here in this transformation, so the coefficient on the disk lies in L2 in general, but is not any better. So even if you don't want to work with L2 coefficients, in a sense, you must, if you want to uh, study the equation over somewhat non-smooth domains. Um, Okay, so now is a theorem which tells about a definition of boundary values modeled after the boundary values we had uh, in the disk. So we first give the theorem, which is essentially a translation of what we uh, of what we had on the disk using conformal map, and then we shall give another interpretation, which is maybe a little bit um, a little bit more friendly. So uh, we first consider a domain, a conformal map, rectifiable domain, a conformal map from the disk onto this rectifiable domain. Uh, say zero is mapped to A, and uh, we denote we denote by P phi the uh, central projection, right? So that's really the uh, um, um, geodesic projection from A, right? So on the disk, you have the uh, central radial projection, which maps A point Z different from the origin to uh, the unit circle following the radius. And you simply conjugate this on omega using the conformal map, right? So you have a projection to the boundary following geodesics. And then um, if you pick a function W in the hardest mirror of class of omega, uh, you can assert that it has a trace on the boundary of omega, uh, which is the almost everywhere limit point-wise of at least a subsequence of uh, functions obtained by uh, projecting W to the boundary using this uh, projection P uh, phi. So this is exactly uh, the same definition as uh, you have on the disk when you uh, compare the restriction of the function to circles, concentric circles inside the unit disk to the value of the function on the boundary circle. Um, of course, this is a pointwise definition of the limit and you need to take a subsequence because you don't have convergence. We already pointed this out in general, but you have LP convergence. So you don't have pointwise convergence except for a subsequence, right? As is the case for LP convergence. But when you look at the LP convergence, you also have a uh, weight here. So this weight pointwise is going to one when uh, 
rho is approaching one, but it is there and needed in order to get LP convergence. So it is not just that this function here, W after a P sub phi to the minus one restricted to the level line, uh, the function that appears here, it is not just that it converges pointwise for a subsequence of rho, but it is that in fact with this weight it converges in LP of uh, the boundary to um, the boundary value of W on um, partial omega. Okay, so this is a little bit uh, natural in a sense to copy what we had on the on the disk uh, using the conformal map. However, it is a little bit ugly. Maybe it is helpful to think of the trace in following terms, and you can show this is equivalent to what we just said. Uh, w uh, restricted to the level lines of the uh, green function uh, defines a uh, measure supported on this level line. So by simply multiplying W with uh, Hausdorff H1 measure, and that one converges weak star to um, a measure on the boundary of omega, which has a density respect to H1. And this density is just a boundary value of W, and uh, also you have convergence again in weak star sense of modulus of W to the P times Hausdorff measure on uh, the sequence of um, level curves of the uh, green function. It converges to the P power of the modulus of the boundary function of W uh, times arc lengths on the boundary. And this kind of uh, weak star convergence may be a bit more helpful to visualize what, what the uh, trace of W to the boundary of omega is. Now that we have defined boundary values, we can at last study boundary value problems. And okay, we start with the um, Marcel Ries type of uh, problem. So the problem is to, uh, uh, to find a W in the Hardy's Mirnev class with prescribed real part to the boundary of omega. And uh, so you need to find the uh, imaginary part so that uh, the prescribed real part plus I times the imaginary part that you must find should be the trace of some hardest mirror function on the boundary. The trace is understood in the previous um, sense. And uh, in the case of the disk, you have this theorem that tells us that this problem is always solvable. And in fact, you can also, uh, you can also impose a mean of the uh, imaginary part of W, that's a little, a little perk. Um, so this, this uh, problem, of course, is very classical for, um, is very classical for uh, holomorphic functions, right? The theorem says that on the disk, it works for pseudo-holomorphic functions of the uh, hardest mirror of class with uh, L2 coefficient. Um, okay, so on the general rectifiable domain, um, it may not be so. Uh, the answer must be qualified. And we introduce one condition, which is very classic, also called AP condition. So when you have an index P between one and infinity, uh, a non-negative weight uh, summable on the circle is, 
is said to satisfy condition AP if <coughs> this quantity that we denote with braces uh, around W uh, sub AP is finite. So this quantity is in fact uh, supreme of the means on intervals of uh, W times the means on of W to the minus one over P minus one, the whole thing to the P minus one. So it's a little bit of a complicated but very classical uh, quantity, and you take the supreme over all arcs in T, right? So this is uh, very well known, and the AP condition appears in a variety of contexts, the most celebrated one being the uh, continuity of the uh, conjugation operator in LP with respect to this um, weighted LP of W norm. Uh, this is a uh, um, muck and help Whedon uh, result. And uh, for pseudo-holomorphic function, we have a Marcia Ries type theorem on rectifiable omega that also involves AP. So if you have a simply connected rectifiable domain and L2 coefficient, and you pick an index P in uh, the interval one infinity, uh, if phi is a conformal map and the modulus of its derivative has AP, so this is a priori an L1 function on the circle, so it's a weight. You can make sense to ask whether it has AP, where if it does, then uh, the uh, Ries problem is solvable. In other words, you can prescribe um, the real part in LP of uh, partial omega, and you can then find W in the Hardy-Smirov class, um, having the real part that you have prescribed, and uh, okay, you get you get estimates where constants only depend on the the data, p omega and alpha. Um, maybe of interest to this, the application of this result to the uh, conductivity equation, which maybe is a I would say the uh, most interesting maybe uh, bit of the talk. Uh, so if we have a simply connected rectifiable domain and if you have a conductivity sigma whose uh, the logarithm of which um, lies in a um, Sobola space of index two, right? So the conductivity is not a general um, function in the sense that it 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 has some regularity, right? Its logarithm is weakly differentiable, and the the uh, derivative lies in L two. Uh, on another hand, uh, the standard theory of uh, elliptic problem deals with uh, conductivities which are bounded, right? Because you, you want strict ellipticity and so it should be strictly positive and should be in L infinity, bounded everywhere. Where this one needs not be, right? It could be, the sigma could be zero and infinity on small sets, but but it, it needs not be strictly elliptic. So it is a particular case because the conductivity has some smoothness, but it is also uh, departing from the, uh, from the uh, strict ellipticity bounds. Now, uh, the situation is that if the uh, derivative of the conformal map has a P, so its modulus on the boundary is a weight having the, uh, satisfying the condition AP. 
then you can solve the Dirichlet problem in the sense that uh, to every boundary uh, function in the LP of the boundary, but weighted by this factor here, right? Which is a trace of the connectivity to the P over two. So there are deep reasons why you need to, uh, to uh, bring in this factor. And of course, um, when sigma is unbounded, this is uh, not innocuous. It changes a number of things. When sigma satisfies standard ellipticity bounds, it is not so important. But when it does not, it plays a role, of course. Then there is a unique solution to the Dirichlet problem with these boundary conditions. So u to the boundary is indeed equal to psi. Uh, but in fact, you, you write it with this. Um, sigma to the one half, um, which is kind of canceling out pointwise, right? In the sense of the boundary values we've been discussing before. But the truth is that the boundary condition mean that these functions here restricted to level lines of the green function, they converge to this function. And of course, the LP convergence involves this as a weight. Okay, so the pointwise convergence for a subsequence holds in the sense that U converges to psi. But the meaning of the, the true meaning of the boundary condition that you get LP convergence of this function to this function. And there you have this weight. Okay, and you get the usual bounds uh, to estimate. Now, maybe, uh, of course, the big question is whether condition AP is necessary for the previous result to hold. And okay, there are technical conditions that, um, that you can give. Uh, and maybe this is not a good place to discuss here uh, for at least two reasons. One is that it is not clear that these conditions have reached um, the correct level of uh, generality or their formulation maybe would evolve um, in the forthcoming weeks or months or Maybe there are better ways to state things. Uh, and also because they are somewhat uh, complicated. Um, uh, however, uh, they imply one thing, which is a little bit simple in a sense that if phi prime satisfies the A, so-called A infinity condition. So this means really that if you make the ratio of the integral of phi prime over a subset E of the boundary of an interval I, and you make the ratio with the integral over I, that's essentially bounded by the ratio of the length to some power gamma. Right, this is the affinity condition. Uh, so if phi prime satisfy the affinity condition, then condition AP is necessary for the for the uh, Dirichlet problem to be solvable. And uh, so in particular, because for the very classical case of Lipschitz domains, you know that the conformal map um, has A2. Uh, you deduce the following theorem that if omega is a simply connected Lipschitz domain and uh, sigma is a connectivity, um, okay, which is here we say it's it's um, bounded below and and Lipschitz on omega. Uh, that is not 
completely necessary, but we stick to this assumption, which is rather conservative. Um, but of course, this is to get to the smoothness of sigma, right? That its logarithm should lie in W12. Then if you take phi a conformal map and you pick an index P, the Dirac Clay problem is solvable in LP if and only if uh, the um, derivative phi prime modulus has a P. Um, this maybe is worth a comment. It has been known for a long time and in any dimension. Um, after the work of many people, so here I just mentioned Jarrison Koenig, who maybe were first to point this out, but even I'm not sh completely sure about that. But the set of P for which directly problem is solvable with data in LP on a Lipschitz domain is an interval of the form two minus epsilon plus infinity. And uh, what we see here is that for a planar domain, this interval corresponds to um, the set of P for which phi prime has a P. So to, to the best of my knowledge, the, uh, the set of those P, those index P for which the directly problem is solvable on the Lipschitz domain was never characterized. And um, in geometric terms, it seems quite complicated. But uh, the meaning of the talk, I, I, I believe is that this set of indices P can be characterized in terms of the, uh, of the uh, analytic parameterization of the domain. And uh, that's uh, when the uh, conformal map has a derivative um, having a P. So uh, when you look at this Dirac Clay problem from the point of view of pseudo homomorphic function, you recognize this set of P as having a meaning uh, with respect to the uh, conformal mapping. And uh, I think I will stop here. very much for a very interesting talk so now now it's time to for questions please if there are questions yes there are a lot of questions from Nizhny Novgorod <laughs> okay perfect the first question is are there any explicit formulas for for the solution of the conductivity equation why a pseudo-holographic functions? Uh, not that I know of. Uh, I, I'm not aware there is there is explicit formulas. No, I, I do not know. I, I I do not know. I doubt it, but I do not know. Yes, thank you. The second question is: Have you tried to fight hidden connections between? works of Vasily Vasilyevich Zhikov devoted to conductivity of perforated domains and your approach. Um, please, can you repeat the question? I, I'm not sure I understood fully what you said. There is, there are a number of uh, works of famous Russian mathematician Vasily Vasilyevich Zhikov in yeah. which in which he, he considered the conductivity of perforated domains on the plane, perforated in some extent, the Sierpinski carpet and so forth. And uh -huh. have you tried to construct uh, any connection between your approach and such problems? Uh, I, yeah, I'm sorry that I think I cannot answer this question right away. Um, I do not know enough about the construction of Vasilyev. I, I came across, of course, um, um, at some point. 
I, I am not sure. Um, I guess, yes, there are connections, but I'm not sure how to stress them. I never, I never took this up so far. Yes, thank you. The third question is, have you applied effectivization of the Riemann theory given by Natanzon and the Brodin in the framework of the Richardson harmonic moments of the domain to construct conformal map from the unit disk to domains with a rectifiable boundary? Uh, these are difficult questions. Um, I guess you can, but I never did that either. Um, I guess you can do something using the um, the original maybe uh, well that's complicated oh. uh, yeah I think probably um, using some of the uh, of the uh, um, representations by formal power series of bursts you could yeah I'm not sure it it must become complicated I think you can certainly write something formally for sure yeah. uh, I'm not sure how far you you can get uh, yeah, I'm sorry this is a difficult question Yes, thank you. And the last question, simple question. Can you give generalization of your, of your last theorem on a simply connected Helder domains? Yes, on a simply connected Helder domain. So not Lipschitz. But uh, by Helder, you mean that the... Uh, the uh, boundaries uh, locally is a graph of a holder function. That's what you mean? Yes. Or you mean that, I mean, the derivative? Yes. What, I mean, you mean holder derivative for the parametrization of, or holder function? A holder derivative, for example. Yeah. Um, well, okay. Uh, there, I think there are um, what you know about the derivative of the conformal map uh, maybe is not completely enough to apply the theorem. Let me think. Let me stall for a second. <laughs> um, well, maybe it would be fruitful to use methods of quasi-conformal mappings developed by Mikhail Lavrentiev, for instance. Well, that may, of course, yeah, that may be, of course. I mean, it is, of course, close to this matter, but I think, okay, maybe you can relax the condition and use quasi-conformal mappings, and this gives you improved regularity. That's possible. This I did not explore. Um, however, I think the should be a connection, I think, um, for a holder, for a holder domains, you don't, um, you don't quite know enough about the derivative to apply directly what I said, 
but maybe you can push things so that it is nevertheless true. Um, well, okay. Maybe maybe another question from Kazakhstan. Yes, yes, thank you. Okay. <laughs> I have. <please. clears throat> There's a question I'd like to ask you either at the end or email you. It's about my question rela related. It's about Beltrami equations. My question related to your talk is maybe this is easy, but what about uh, Alfors conditions for the boundary? Does, is this uh, good enough? No, Alfors condition is not good enough, but of course, Alfors condition plus something is good enough, like, uh, like in the Lavantiev domain. So, Alfors alone, I don't think, is enough to uh, buy you the AFID condition. But Alfors plus something small, yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Professor Mitushev has a question. Yeah, I rather no question, but I would like to answer the question about uh, Zhikov. And yes, uh, this uh, investigation consider the same question in the following sense. Zhikov considered it a problem in double periodic functions with the same coefficients. Actually, he was interested rather uh, with jump when function sigma has jump on uh, uh, in composite materials when we have jump of uh, physical conviction. But uh, it is. It was. Uh, I know there are papers. Not exactly maybe Zhikov, but Zhikov, but others, when uh, the function sigma uh, sigma was con was considered like uh, a continuous function, and actually it can be considered like this function, and it's very useful, also for effective properties. And addition about exact formulas. So actually, if you need uh, exact formulas, uh, you may ask about uh, Riemann-Hilbert problem problem for doubly periodic functions. So if you, uh, I have such formulas for piecewise constant functions because uh, the problem for multiply connected domain in uh, double periodic functions uh, is used. I think this question about relation to Zhukov is very, very interesting because Zhukov considered it and this group question related to homogenization and this more uh, refined question related to generalized analytic function. Okay, thank you very much. Uh -huh. Thank you. I, I have a small uh -huh. question uh, also, Laurent. Uh, yeah. So, um, uh, in the case when sigma in the conductivity equation is complex value. Uh, complex, oh. Uh -huh. Complex valued, yes. Uh, then you you can relate that conductivity equation to the bi-complex uh, uh, vacuum equation. Uh -huh. So, have you explored uh, something in that direction? Um, yes, but uh, for the moment, I have no definite conclusion. So, when sigma is complex, it's um, it is uh, very interesting, and actually, you can do things. Um, okay, there, there, of course, the. Uh, um the uh, quasi conformal mapping is is coming in you can you can do things but you need to assume that r is strictly bigger than than 2 you you need uh, I, i'm not able to to get what i explained with some ability index which is uh which is 2 i need i need to get more which means that I have to put a bit more regularity on sigma. Uh, right now, I'm not I'm not able to uh, consider uh, complex sigma and get the same conclusion. Okay, I see. I see. There, there are. I, I think this is also maybe a little bit my being clumsy because I'm 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 confident some things can be said. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. If there are more questions or comments. If this is not the, 
Yeah, I see. Oh, okay, okay. Pro no. Pro Professor Matilevich, do you have a question? Uh, maybe more, uh, I can give a comment. Uh, okay, yeah. If I understand, uh, one professor asked about uh, domain uh, with uh, derivative <coughs> holder. And if I understand, uh, it is also called Yapunov domain, but it is um, uh, rectifiable boundary with uh, uh, length parameter. And with respect to length parameter, we say that the derivative is in holder. And if I understand, it is uh, maybe enough condition. And uh, if I think uh, quickly, it could be in that situation Lipschitz domain. But concerning Alfors condition, if I understand its condition, which describes quasi conformal mapping, and it is uh, maybe too general for this uh, theorem to hold, but it is quick uh, observation. So, Uh, oh, yes, point. I think not not enough, but Alphors plus something small. Uh, okay, Alphors plus your, something uh, is possible, but in only Alphors uh, because uh, if we have quasi conformal mapping uh, of the plane to the plane, uh, uh, the image of the circle is uh, satisfies the Alphors condition, but it could be more general. Yes. Uh, uh, plus something, okay, someone should think about it. Okay, only I, I uh, try to give a comment. Uh, also in some paper I was working with the Apunov curves, uh, and in that situation we can prove a lot of uh, result for the Apunov domain. Uh -huh. Okay, it's basically what I wanted to. Thank you. Thank you. If there aren't any other questions, I'll ask one of the question I had. It's just about uh, Beltrami equations, if I may, uh, because it's uh, about, something what? I'm stuck on. Beltrami equations. Oh, yeah? It's something I'm stuck on. I just wonder if you know anywhere to look. I've asked, for instance, Astala. It's not the sort of thing he does. So people who study quasi-conformal mappings, they want to know uh, when the equation is degenerate, they want to know that the solution is a homeomorphism. I have special case which shows up in a sort of boundary behavior of a, a holomorphic motion where the degenerate equation has a degenerate solution, but I'd like to understand it better. Is it, do you know anything like that? Uh, not really. So these are global problems. Um, no, I, I only know Astella's book basically, and mm -hmm. uh, I know some. Okay, I know some people work on um, degeneracy, but but uh, I never I never studied uh, really this this aspect. So I know I I cannot help. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Laurent, for a very interesting talk. So. Thank you. So the pleasure was mine. So, uh, okay, thank you, everybody. I'm moved that so many people I can hear from a very remote part of the world, seen from my desk. So I'm 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 moved that I can communicate still, in spite of the pandemic, with colleagues um, um, in Russia and. Uh, some of them really far away, right? Yeah, th this is precisely the idea of this seminar. Yeah. Thank you and thanks to all participants. Yeah. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.